We're okay? Good. Right. So today I'm going to talk about everything. Um, and very briefly. But what I want to focus on are things which actually relate to the previous talk in the sense that our position also affects the questions that we ask about the universe and we've got a lot of mysteries out there at the moment and in my view um, what we ask is related to those mysteries. So back in 2005 Science Magazine wrote a list of what are the most important challenges for science in the 21st century and the top of the list was what is the universe made of, the title of this talk, and for the past 14 years, I've been pursuing a alternative point of view, which relates to looking at the universe that we actually see and asking, where are the biggest holes in our theory and where does that lead us? So it's been um, featured on the cover of New Scientist a few times. Of course, this is a dangerous rag, but it has been in more respectable places as well. Now. According to the, our current view of the universe, um, using the results from the Planck satellite, which I'll talk a little bit more about, the universe today is made of about 20% dark energy, about 25%, numbers vary, uh, uh, dark matter, so stuff that is not like the ordinary stuff that we are used to, and the rest of it, 5% is stuff that we know and understand. This hasn't always been the case because things change in cosmic history, so I will point out um, what was happening in co cosmic history. But in my view, there are related questions, and um, so what is the universe made of is related to some fundamental questions, in particular what's the difference between motion and cosmic expansion, and where is infinity? Now, I don't have time to go into all of the physics behind that, but what I wish to present is a viewpoint that there are really basic things which Einstein left out of his theory, which we still have to understand, and the cosmic mysteries are related to understanding those questions. And moreover, this is testable, and it will be tested in the next decade. Right, so with a public audience, one must begin with Cosmology 101, and you're a skeptic, so you want evidence for all the things we say. Uh, and I will go through at least the first three main pillars of evidence in turn. The first piece of evidence we have about the universe is the cosmic rig shift. The universe is expanding almost uniformly. There is the cosmic microwave background radiation, the echo radiation from the Big Bang, so we know that the universe was in a hot, dense state, as the sitcom tells you. And there are things we know about light element abundances which tell us about what we know the universe was made of at particular times in its history. And then there are many, many other things which, which we've got better and better at uh, measuring and detecting, and so there are loads of other things, but these are the main pillars that have been around for a very long time. Now, the first pillar is the redshift of uh, light. So if we observe distant galaxies, we see that spectral lines are moved from the ordinary position that we are used to seeing them at, and if the audio works, that's a very familiar effect about the change in frequency of something that is moving towards you or receding away from you when it's moving towards you, the frequency increases. When it goes away from you, the frequency decreases. Um, so that effect also happens to light, but in a different way, uh, respecting special relativity. Uh, but we have to be careful because there are different ways of getting redshift, and the Big Bang certainly was not an expansion in a pre-existing space. It's not like that. Uh, so there is differences between motion and expansion. And if you're thinking about motion, really, you need a reference frame with re which respect to define motion. And in general relativity, motion is really only defined locally at a point. So 
in some sense, if I write down a distance and divide it by a time, and it's not, nothing relating to local motion, that, and work out the rate of change of one with respect to the other, given some distance and some time, that can exceed the speed of light, and it doesn't disobey relativity. It's just um, the fact that motion relates to local reference frames. So the universe is not an explosion in pre-existing space. It is expanding about every space, and the best analogy is to think about currents in self-raising dough, and no matter which current you look at, you'll see the other currents expanding away from you as long as your dough is in the expanding phase before you put it in the oven. So the universe is expanding about every point, and by that we mean that this is on scales which are larger than the things which have broken away from the expansion. So space is not expanding in this room unless you smoked something before you came in. <laughs> it is not expanding in the solar system. It is not expanding in the galaxy. It's not expanding in clusters of galaxies. Only when you get to scales which are bigger than clusters of galaxies, the biggest bound structures which have stopped the expansion of the universe because they've got enough mass to overcome the initial expansion rate, only then do you get to scales in which the universe is expanding. So between clusters of space, in some literal sense, space is still being created. So as I tell my students, space is nothing, there's just more of it as time goes by. Now, you shouldn't have the picture of a uh, expanding ex explosion of pre-existing space, so what you do instead um, is look at light cones. So we always have to look at time and space. Uh, so if you ever watched the, the first movie about Stephen Hawking, he drew one of these on Liverpool Street um, railway station with a piece of chalk, because that's all theorists love to do. But, of course, he couldn't do an animated GIF. <laughs> now, what we see here is um, the light cone. So a long time ago, we could see less of the universe. We imagine ourselves on this point here, these are galaxies which are getting further and further away from us as time goes by. And they send us signals along the light cone. The light cone bends back on itself because the universe was hot and dense a long time ago. So uh, if, if you imagine if there was such a thing as a point with the Big Bang, then it would be smeared out over the whole sky now. Um, and we learn a lot by looking at the history, how, how does this thing expand over time, but this is, you know, and we've got galaxies at different redshift, so of course we are looking back in time as we look back in the universe. We, if we look back to very old galaxies with the Hubble Deep Space Telescope, we are seeing them when they were very young. And the furthest we can look back is the cosmic microwave background radiation, and before that the universe was opaque. So we measure the expansion history with different things, standard candles, standard rulers, so a, uh, we've already seen um, the redshift. The redshift tells us how much something has expanded. Uh, and then we also have uh, things like standard candles, so something which is further away will appear dimmer. And so that gives us a measure of distance. And with a measure of distance and um, a measure uh, of expansion from the redshift, how much the frequency has changed, we can work out the expansion history. Now, one problem, of course, is that um, McDonald's haven't built big signs which are of equal wattage all the way back to the Big Bang. We have to use standardizable candles, and that's where lots and lots of cans of worms um, enter. And the best one, well, one of the ones, not well, actually, it's not going to be the best one soon, but uh, for the meantime, one thing that we use are uh, type 1a supernovae, so you see some supernova there, it's not there, there it goes off. And type 1a supernovae, that would be another lecture, but because they are a white dwarf close to its Chandrasekhar limit, they, they, in some sense they are insensitive to their initial conditions, not completely, and therefore they go off. They're more a standard bomb than a standard candle, but with such measurements or such observations, we've determined since 1998 that the expansion rate of the universe appears to be accelerating. Now, 
that evidence is based on, was based on a few supernova back then, it's now based on many supernova. And that immediately poses an interesting question because gravity, ordinary gravity with ordinary matter, whether it's dark matter that we don't understand, but as long as it's matter, matter will cause things to clump gravitationally, it will want to stop, uh, slow down expansion. So in order to have something which is with the expansion rate which is increasing, you need an extra force, something repulsive in the vacuum of space. Einstein had introduced such a thing back in 1917, so it's now 102 years old, because back in his day, he didn't imagine that the universe could have had a beginning. He talked to, it was philosophically anathema, and if he looked at the universe, he saw the astronomers of the day um, told him that, well, the universe was roughly about the density of our galaxy, because back at that time, people didn't know that the nebulae were distant galaxies. Uh, so it seemed a reasonable assumption to Einstein to assume, well, I've got these randomly distributed stars, and they're roughly homogeneous, so I can assume that it's the same roughly everywhere, and why should the universe have a beginning? Let's introduce something to make it stop. Uh, wanting to change. So the thing about gravity is it makes things want to change. This, the, the cosmological constant that he introduced was finely tuned in order to stop the expansion that required the universe to be closed in on itself. There are many things related to that. So it was introduced back in 1917. The one that we have today has a different value. That one was fine-tuned, which is why Einstein said it was his biggest mistake, because he knew it was not stable. Give it a little push and it will want to start changing with time. Now, let's look now at the, um, the hot Big Bang, pillar number two. So when the universe started out, when it was less than about 380,000 years old, it was a hot, dense plasma. That's to say there were no atoms. It was too hot for atoms to exist. It was just charged particles, protons, helium nuclei, electrons, and if you take a box of something which is hot and you expand it adiabatically, that's say without transferring energy in or out of the box, it will cool down. The same thing happened to the universe. And early on, the universe was opaque because light will scatter from free electrons just as it does inside the sun. But when the average temperature cooled down below a certain threshold, which is less than the, related to the binding energy of hydrogen, it then became favorable for hydrogen atoms to form. So at that point, the universe became transparent, and those photons which scattered from the last free electrons have been traveling to us ever since. And they make this fantastic background radiation all over the sky, so there's enough people here who are old enough to have measured it with their analog television. Um, some of the hiss between stations, if you did the same experiment, if people had analog televisions, a lot of the hiss is actually... Uh, commercially made now from too many uh, Wi-Fi's and other things, but um, what you get is a perfect black body spectrum. So this is the intensity of radiation with wavelength, and the, this is, was made a long time ago, back in 1990, this, um, this graph, and the error bars, the uncertainties are here because they're smaller than the width of the pen. It's a really fantastically precise measurement, and it has an average temperature there. That average temperature today is 2.75 degrees Kelvin. It's been because the wavelength of light of, the, of this radiation has been stretched by the expansion of the universe. It's a lot cooler than it would have been when it was 3,000 degrees Kelvin. Now, when we measure that, we measure it. It's very boring because the average temperature is the same everywhere on the sky. Um, it's isotropic, but that's also a very important clue about the universe. Uh, we see something which we interpret as motion, and I will come to, well, I might get to talking about that, but um, if I am in a bath which, of thermal photons which are the same everywhere and I'm rushing in one particular direction, I will scoop up more photons in this direction than the direction behind me. So I'll see the sky to be hotter in that direction and cooler behind me. And we understand this from special relativity, um, and so we know that there will be a dipole, this yin-yang diagram uh, on the sky. Now, in general relativity, there's other things that can do it, right? So, so here is a first, my first skeptical scientist question. 
Um, is this entirely due to motion? We're assuming that, but that's assuming a lot of things. So we see this motion, once we subtract it from the average temperature, then we are led to something like this. So this was the sky as seen by the uh, WMAP Wilson Microwave Anisotropy Probe back in 2003 to 2009, roughly, and uh, they produced a lovely animation. So these relate to over-densities and under-densities. Where it is blue, it's a little bit over-dense because light has had to travel come out of little wells. So the differences from smoothness at that time were about one part in a hundred thousand. So the universe was really, really smooth and little changes in density, but those little differences in density formed stars and galaxies and clusters of galaxies and an amazing sort of structure. And here we are today looking back through it all, back as far as we can see. So this is looking back on that teardrop our past light cone to the cosmic microwave radiation which is coming to us from all over the sky and you could register as a hiss in your analog television station between the stations. Now that was back in the a decade ago we've got a better measurement of it now so from the Planck satellite so if we look at those fluctuations so this is the tiny differences after we've subtracted the, our motion or something like that, uh, little over-densities and under-densities. And we can learn a lot about that. And when we look at the power, so if I look at two points on the sky, so I look at every, point, every pair of points which is one degree apart, then look at every pair of points which is 15 degrees, which are 15 degrees apart, look at every pair of points which are 0 0.001 degrees apart, and see what's the temperature difference then that has a pattern in it which is related to sound waves in the primordial plasma. And if we plot that in a particular way, which uh, people, physicists know about, if you do spherical harmonics, these are small angles, these are large angles, and there is a peak. And the peak relates to the scale at which the differences in temperature are the biggest. Now I'll show you what we mean by that in a moment. I just want to explain what these mean. So, What's happened here is that up to the time the universe is 380,000 years old, uh, the there are sound waves on every scale. They're doing all of this, but there's one sound wave which has just had time enough to do one compression or one rarefaction. So there'll be over densities and under densities at a particular scale which relates to the speed of sound and how far sound can have traveled in 380,000 years, and that gives the first peak. Then the next one, compression and rarefaction undo each other, and that gives a second peak. Then you get compression, compression, compression on a much smaller scale, and that gives the third peak. So compression, rarefaction will tend to undo things. Compression, compression and compression or rarefaction, rarefaction will um, reinforce, and that's on a on smaller scale. So from the pattern of the sound waves and the speed of sound, and the speed of sound tells us about what the universe was made of in terms of matter at that time, then we can deduce a lot of things. And so from that Planck satellite data, we deduce a lot of things from this diagram here. But as a skeptic, there's one thing you've got to worry about, and that is that you're putting in a cosmological model. Measurement is the most abused word in cosmology. What we actually measure are fluxes of radiation changes in frequencies, angles on the sky. In order to turn all of those measurements into something like this, we need a model. In fact, we need a model of the universe. So our preconceptions are inter uh, interfering with the way that we use the word measurement. And most, most cosmologists will use the word measurement to describe this, well, whereas, whoops, that wasn't. Whereas, actually, if you take the data, and this data itself has been averaged by looking at the, uh, the, the, the satellite is sweeping around the sky so many times over many different uh, cycles of the Earth's orbit around the sun, and that's already, this is already averaged data, but this is only data which has been averaged. That's what you actually have, and to interpret what you got, the precision, requires a model. 
Now, there is one part of the measurement which you can see with your eye. So there is a particular scale in here, and you can see with your eye that this looks closest to that as compared to this and this. Because what that is me measuring within a model is the distance to the last scattering surface, the, the, the epoch at which those last, the electrons which, uh, the photons which are scattered from the last free electrons at that epoch, and they've been traveling to us ever since, there's a distance to that, and that tells us something about the spatial curvature, provided you assume that spatial curvature comes in three flavors only, vanilla, strawberry, and chocolate. And we've got vanilla. Now, actually, there's nothing in Einstein's theory that tells us that spatial curvature comes in three flavors. That's where we're putting in the model, and that's part of the model which is giving us that precision, whereas this is actually what we have. So, what I'm interested in in the game that I do is looking at differences because there are a lot of things about the standard model of cosmology which are beginning to crack and, and fall apart. And so I've got a particular model of cosmology which is, deals with uh, a lot of issues from fundamental principles. Uh, I call it the timescape for reasons I'll tell you about. But if you look at these figures, one, two, and three, there are some curves here. So these are Hubble diagrams at different redshifts. So the redshift is the amount, the fractional amount by which the uh, frequency or wavelength of light has changed. So if at zero, that's where we are today. There's no change, but if uh, the, you know, things have stretched or, or et cetera by a factor of two or uh, 1100. So the nearby universe, which we can measure with supernova, is up to about a redshift of one. Quasars, and old galaxies go up to redshift, well, they actually go about seven or eight, but we see few, fewer of them. And then if we look at the cosmic microwave background radiation, it goes um, to a redshift of 1100. So what I'm going to present is a different cosmology, and if I fit it, so let's now assume the curvature does not come in three flavors, but we have to take an average in an interesting way, then, uh, and I fit it, now I can fit the distance quite nicely, and when I fit the distance at large redshifts, it will match a different value of the, so what people think is dark energy at lower redshifts. It so happens that it fits at lower redshifts, this dotted line here, the lower one is the one that is closest to the supernova data, and this is the one that is closest to the CMB data. So when people fit this, usually they have different values of matter, and, and dark energy, and they uh, then look at where they overlap, and uh, they will just plot things on one plot. What I'm doing is looking at things in a totally different way, because I'm dealing with a model cosmology which interpolates between different models, which um, would be have different amounts of dark energy and different amounts of matter in them. The third pillar of the hot Big Bang, I'll just go through briefly, and that relates to light element abundances. So when the universe was very, was about a second to one minute old, uh, then all the light elements, helium in particular, were synthesized, everything else was synthesized in stars. And we can work out the fractional amounts of those just using nucleosynthesis. And if we actually went away and did the measurements, this is what we would have had before anybody knew about the details of the cosmic microwave background radiation, the model dependence. Now would suggest that it's this, but this is with respect to a model, whereas this is just the measurements of the actual abundances from stars. And there are, there's something hidden in there called the primordial lithium abundance anomaly. So, the Lambda CDM model we now uh, believe is something like this. Uh, early on in the Lambda CDM model, things were different, right, because dark energy only plays is important at late times. Radiation was much more important early on, and radiation is made of neutrons and photons. Ne sorry, neutrinos and photons. Um, so, first of all, a difference between dark energy and dark matter. Dark matter 
is something that we infer gravitationally, and the best known example is the, that of the bullet cluster. This little cluster of galaxies has zipped through this one, and if we look at gravitational lensing, we see that the mass is concentrated here, but if we look at it in X-rays, we see the shock front, and that is made from uh, ionized uh, gas, so there is ionized gas, which is most of the ordinary matter in clusters of galaxies, and because of electromagnetic interactions, it trails behind the thing that's moving, and we can see it because it's lit up. So this stuff is normally dark, but it's dark ordinary matter, and it's lit up, and from that we can see that most of the mass is here, most of the dark ordinary matter is here, and there's a difference. So that is usually the argument for dark matter. It's based on an approximation using Newtonian gravity also, that's a caveat. Now, the universe appears to have been not, uh, not accelerating, but decelerating for most of the time, and accelerating re recently. So if you take the difference in magnitude between a universe which neither accelerates nor decelerates, and anything else, and this is the data, then uh, if it was neither accelerating nor decelerating, there'd be, you'd just have a, ze a line which is zero here, but the data fits something which is, was decelerating in the past and accelerating now. And we can understand that because the density of matter decreases. So if I've got mass and a volume and I make the volume bigger, the density goes down. It drops o as one over the length cubed. So this is going, if the a is the length of the box, it's going down as one over length cubed. Radiation goes as one over length to the fourth. Radiation was much more important than matter early on. But dark energy, the cosmological constant, is just constant. It means that it will eventually beat anything else. And there's a problem then known as the cosmic coincidence problem. Why are we living at a particular time in which dark energy is just overtaking dark matter? Because this is today, this is the future, this is the past. Now, is there another explanation? It is repulsive in many ways. Um, and we know that uh, the theory on which we base things is, is general relativity, that space tells matter how to move and matter tells space how to curve, but we also know that we're making a gross approximation. We're assuming that the universe expands everywhere on average as, just as if there was no structure that I could take everything and smooth it into a featureless fluid. But the universe is full of structure. There are a lot of things that we don't know about gravity. Most things that we know we don't know is about quantum gravity, but I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about the, the things that most people never talk about. Um, in Newton's theory, we've got kinetic energy and potential energy. We add them together, and it's a constant. Total energy is conserved. It is a little known fact that in general relativity, energy is not conserved. <laughs> energy is only conserved in special circumstances. And this relates to the strong equivalence principle. It's a way in which the dynamical nature of space and time get mixed up with ordinary mass energy. One way to think about it is this. Well, what is a conservation law? It's that something does not change in time. But in general relativity, you then ask, who's time. You've got to be able to define a canonical observer with whom, with respect to, there's no change. And usually it's an observer at infinity. Um, so the current standard cosmology is really best described by Friedman tells space how to curve and Newton tells matter how to move. We don't actually use special general relativity beyond the Friedman equation. There are a lot of things we know about general relativity which um, relate to the fact that it is, uh, you can think of, whoops, dynamical, maybe this one didn't work. Oh yeah, so we always have the rubber sheet analogy where you go and you drop the, the uh, cannonball into the rubber sheet and then you roll marbles on it and you see, you imagine this is like the space and uh, you see the orbit of a, of a coin which is going to be dropped on here 
and if there was no friction, it would go round and round forever, and you'd see Kepler's law, and a lot of, lot of nice things relating to the curvature of space-time. Of course, this is an analogy that there's a two-dimensional sheet here, but if, I, if we go and look at Venus when it's on the other side of the Sun, there is literally more space in three dimensions between us and Venus, and we can measure that um, by bouncing radar signals off. We do, can do that every day, as long as Venus is on the other side of the Sun. Now, what is not shown in this thing is there is a reference frame and so when people talk about this, they don't talk about the reference frame. And the reference frame there, which in this case is the wood on the edge, is setting what we think about as infinity. And as long as I've got a bound structure and I've got, there was no rest of mass in the rest of the universe, I can define a clock at infinity, but the universe has got lots of structures inside it. So... The problem of how do I fit one geometry inside another geometry has never been solved. It's in the too hard basket. So we just ignore the problem and just assume, let us assume that we're an observer who uh, is in a universe with no structure and the only difference is a motion, a peculiar motion. Now the actual universe is full of really complicated structures. If we look nearby, 40% of the volume of the universe is in voids of just one particular size. Um, and if we add on other things, then the void fraction is, gets to something like 70 to 80 percent. So we're talking about regions in which the density is incredibly, it's almost, not quite, almost empty space. Um, and if we want to ask ourselves how big do we make the universe a uh, box until it looks, one box looks roughly the same size as the other, it's a scale of about 450 million light years, about three times the largest things which are typically um, inhomogeneous. So that's in words, but we can look at it in, in pictures. If we take, if we look far back in time to the Hubble Deep Field, at that time you could say, well, those galaxies are roughly distributed in, in a homogeneous way. But if you come to the present day, you take our galaxy and make it a point, and then you zoom out, what you see is... Uh, what you see is more interesting structures, these voids. So this is best seen with 3D glasses, but what we've created here is some false density. And so that gives you a picture of the voids, the voids being typically 140 million light years across. And if you go away and do simulations... Um, oops. If you go away and do simulations and you have to do many, you take the real survey and you do many simulations, you'll see that on some scale it looks kind of the same. But if you go closer up, then you'll see that actually the universe appears to be more have more voids than the simulations. So the simulations are using the standard model with Newtonian gravity because we can't actually do this problem in general relativity. And on closer scales, it gets a lot messier. So that is one of the problems with the standard model and of course there are lots of questions about bias when you go and sample things in the sky so you have to there are a lot of things to consider but basically we see a lot of structures so things called the Great Wall the Sloan Great Wall uh, and we see voids and there's another interesting cosmic coincidence the universe appears to start accelerating just when the stuff, go, when all the structure becomes defined. So we say that's going non-linear. So there's another cosmic coincidence which looks like a smoking gun. So why does apparent acceleration start at the same time as the complex structures form? Have we screwed it up? So that's my opinion. Is yes, we have. We're looking at it far too simply. And you can realise that. Acceleration is an apparent effect in the following sense. To take uh, what we actually measure a distance is, and to get an acceleration, I've got to divide a distance by a time. There's an interesting question there, whose time? But if I have some voids, if everything is expanding and things just slow down because, um, because of the matter in them, and if initially the voids are very, form a very small fraction, in fact, less than a part in 10,000, um, 
but they decelerate less because there's less matter, whereas in the other regions will decelerate more. So what happens is that later on the voids occupy more volume, and when you look back on your past light cone, and later on it will get such that this red stuff is a very thin strip. When you look back on your past light cone, you're taking an average over all of these different regions and assuming that they're the same, but they're not. So it, when your average takes in more voids, than other regions, it can appear that the universe is suddenly starting to accelerate in its expansion rate because you're using the wrong model. So there are a number of people who believe this is a serious viewpoint, and of course uh, we're against the majority of the community and we've had a lot of interesting debates because one of the people on the other side is a president of the International Society on General Relativity and Gravitation, so we had to, um, when we took the count of you, we got two presidents. <laughs> two past presidents, three editors of a well-known journal to write a, um, uh, a paper. So this approach is called back reaction. You take the idea seriously that we have to look at averages of Einstein's equations and then we have to think about what you do when you take general averages and it's a lot more complicated and it's a lot less popular because most people's careers are built on uh, writing down, you can do a lot of crazy nonsense as long as you just solve differential equations, you don't have to think, you see, you can, a good particle physicist can think of 10 new particles before breakfast, now, even without coffee. Um, so, so, is there dark energy or is it something related to cosmic structure? So my contribution to the thing has been to look at um, how do we interpret general averages of Einstein's equations? So the fitting problem was introduced by George Ellis, who was a student together with Stephen Hawking back in Cambridge. He's actually a bit older, was a bit older than Stephen. Um, but the person who thought about it most is Thomas Buchert there. And so Buchert has a way of taking general averages of Einstein's equations. And what I did was to think about how you would interpret this. And the thing here, if I take a box which is large enough that there, one box is more or less the same as the other, and that means making it about 450 light, million light years across, because we've got voids, and the biggest typical void is about 140 million light years across, then there are two ways of looking at it. One is by volume, and the average position by volume is in a void with no matter. Whereas everything that we measure, that we actually take observations of, is stuff that has to be greater than the critical density. It has to be dense enough that it forms structures in the first place. So we've got a little selection problem, which is, relates to something called the Copernican principle. We are typical observers, but we're typical observers for observers in a galaxy. The original Copernican principle problem came about because we didn't realize that, okay, in the solar system, we're actually in a very privileged position because we're standing on the surface of the planet, which is rotating. If I took an average position by volume in the solar system, I wouldn't be rotating. I would never come to the view that the, the Earth was at the center of the universe. So what we're doing is coming to a viewpoint based on the spatial curvature in our location and then extrapolating it over all scales because it's nice and simple to think that there is only a universe which in, in which spatial curvature comes in three flavors. But Einstein didn't order that. In fact, if you think about the principles of his theory more closely, then you wouldn't expect that at all. So what I did, and I can't, don't have time to describe it, is to go back and think about a few foundational questions. So the most fun I've ever had is redoing a thought experiment that Einstein did in the uh, 19, well, 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago now, thinking about a problem that he never thought about, and what's the difference between motion and expansion. And I extended his idea to something I call the cosmological equivalence principle, and from that you can put restrictions on the general averages. So what it means, in effect, is something which is interesting and curious. There is a time dilation in this, it's a theory, it's a hypothesis, and it can be tested. There's a gravitational time dilation effect which is different from the one that we're used to thinking of. We're used to thinking of things like the GPS system that uh, even if we're fixed, we know that 
with relative motion, our clocks will differ, but even if I'm at a fixed distance from another um, satellite, then there is a difference because where, where the mass is more concentrated, uh, the clocks will go slower. So that's not the effect that I'm talking about, and if that was just the effect, then this would have all been solved later on. There is another question is, how do I calibrate two clocks at infinity when everything else is changing? So there is a different sort of time dilation, I claim, related to that, and what it means, in effect, is that the universe has more than one age. That the way of thinking about average expansion in the most natural sense is with a different clock, and it's related to a clock of a particular observer in a void, and that clock observer would say that the universe is about 17 billion years old instead of 14 billion. So, and it's very important because when you turn a, dist a, a, a distance into an acceleration, you've got to understand which clock you're taking the derivative with respect to. So what appears as... Um, uh, what was actually deceleration can actually appear as acceleration if you take the wrong clock. So we can go away and do various things. So as I said, the, uh, the, the, with a phenomenological model, you get different ages of the universe depending on which observer you are. You also find that the nearby Hubble constant varies depending on the scale of measurement, and this is very interesting because in the last couple of years, a big controversy has arisen about the value of the Hubble constant. It's now observed to be discrepant. And what pe most people don't understand, typically, is that they're used to thinking about relative decelerations of static observers, whereas what I'm talking about is a very tiny effect, a relative volume deceleration which is very tiny. So something which is very tiny, and it's less than an angstrom per second squared, if you integrate that over the lifetime of the universe, over, if, uh, for us, over 14 billion years, it can give you something which is, differs by 4 billion years, and that seems, seems totally crazy and outlandish, which is why most people will not want to do this. Um, but it does solve the cosmic coincidence problem because you can quantify it. And in terms of the void fraction, and you'll see that apparent acceleration starts when the void fraction gets to about 58%. So it's, it's actually, you got rid of that problem. So you can go away and you fit soap and over data. And in fact, with the most recent set that we can have access to, because there's all these issues about the many cans of worms relating to the data. Um, the timescape model and the Lambda CDM model, so this is the same diagram that I showed you when there's apparent, in our case, it's apparent acceleration, deceleration. The timescape model, it's called the timescape because of the differences in time, um, is always a little bit flatter because it's only apparent, and um, they fit, uh, well, within, with Bayesian evidence, you can't tell the difference between them. The timescape model fits slightly better. The important thing is that it's testable. So being skeptic, you have to have evidence. And the differences between those three curves and the timescape model at any redshift, it is about 1% to 3%. You need very, very high precision. So the Euclid satellite, which will be launched in 2022, will enable tests of that. So it's doable. And the, what you can actually do is test the Friedman equation, not just test my model. So other people have done the analysis, so this is not my analysis, it's other people's analysis. And if, so this is what you think of as the spatial curvature, which should be constant here, and it should be close to zero. And that's the best fit of the data at present, and the timescape prediction, uh, I'm using their graph, and it's, it's that green line, which is somewhere in here, and the thing is, these are the uncertainties at present. Well, actually, they've come down a bit since 2014, but uh, you, both models fit. But with Euclid and a lot of supernova, they've done a projection that these are the, this is what it should be. Those uncertainties, that's the, the, the curve. Instead of building that blue line should fit in here. And so I've got a prediction that at this redshift, you will see a difference by this amount. So. I've got a while to wait because that's the time scale over which things happen in cosmology. But at least I can, you know, you, you've got to make a prediction. <laughs> uh, and uh, 
if it's the standard model, then I can just retire and do something else. That's science. Yeah. All right. So uh, if it's not the standard model, then it gets exciting. Then this will all suddenly become fashionable because no one will touch it until um, everybody, people tend to do, when I present these ideas, the first question usually is, oh, that's really interesting. What do other people think? Now, uh, there are lots of cans of worms which I don't have time to get into about the statistical homogeneity scale and supernova. These things are supposed to be constant. Uh, we actually went away and looked for the statistical homogeneity scale in a model independent way and we found it. Um, and there are a n number of things relating to apparent motion. So uh, if in the standard model, it, the difference between the uniform expansion is always just a, a little motion, so that every galaxy is going at some motion, and the dipole in the cosmic microwave background radiation is purely due to motion. In fact, it can be due to other things in general relativity, and so we looked at that in a model-independent way by just looking at averages of the distance redshift relation in spherical shells. So there are typical larger structures here which are about 140 light million light years across. If you look at small scales, you'll see variation in the expansion rate because it looks, it'll look as if the universe, things are expanding faster across the void and less here. When you take a big shell, which is as bit larger than the largest typical structures, you'll see something which is an average Hubble law. So the, the Hubble law that you see will be, um, there'll be a structure to it. Now, everybody knows about that, but they usually just think about, well, it's a uniform thing, and then everything else has a motion. So we could test that, and we found that actually the motion is most uniform, is more uniform in the local group reference frame, and that was something that people didn't expect. So we found something which is um, a different viewpoint on standard things, and moreover, it can potentially explain some features of the CMB which are anomalous. We have a formula to describe something which people think of as an anomaly. So, just come to the end. So, um, let's just skip over that stuff because I, I knew I'd run out of time. The thing is, th this is also testable because there are things coming online. With gravitational waves, we'll be able to work out very precise distances, much better than supernova, which still have lots of observational cans of worms sitting in them. So if we see neutron star, neutron star merges, and we see a few hundreds of those, we might be able to test this also, test the idea that there is something in there other than pure motion, which is telling us the difference between what people think of as smooth and what is not smooth on small scales. So, to conclude, dark energy is said as the greatest cosmic mystery of our time. Either it means that there are new fields and forces in nature that, you know, 95% of the stuff is stuff that we're not used to. So, one thing that I didn't mention was that the, the fact we know that there is dark matter comes, if, as long as we're doing the right model early on, <laughs> caveat, um, is that we know things about... Um, the speed of sound, and uh, the light element abundances. So if you want to have dark matter, it has to have formed before the first, um, the, the first atoms formed. So from that, we know that there is stuff which is not the usual stuff. So either we're doing, dealing with that, or we have to modify gravity, or we have to deal with the fact that actually we live in a lumpy universe, and Einstein's theory is not complete. So. In my work over the past 14 years, I have developed, working with a few other people, on the, uh, respectable people who are very serious people, but a minority, um, a, a framework in which you can think about the problem differently by returning to first principles, looking at what is not there in Einstein, what Einstein left out. So, as far as I'm concerned, there are subtle issues because Einstein didn't actually finish general relativity even not in the quantum regime, and that, that's what it's all about. So, um, but it's testable, so as far as I'm concerned, Einstein's revolution is not complete, and in 10 years' time, I'll either be right or wrong. Questions for David? Um, so, if 
Um, would, would your model have any impact on how we measure distances in the universe? Because you talked about differences between um, the timescape model and the Lambda CDM model and which, um, yes. which cosmology, it, it, okay. <laughs> so um, if, um, if I'm working on finding the distances to a group of quasars, for example, would I have to take your model into account? Um, well, you measure the distances directly, right? So and the thing you want to do is to take out all the model dependence as much as you can out of the distance measurement. So the thing is, um, you can you you, may, you 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 measure the distance and then you test the model, um, but the, 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 they would be slightly different. So at any the, there are differences of about one to three percent at any redshift. So that will certainly give di differences. It's just that the, the any model which is a good model has to be close to the standard model because the standard model is a very good model. It's just phenomenological. You put in. There are two things, there are lots of things we don't understand about gravitational energy, so we put dark matter in to make gravity stronger on small scales, and then we put in dark energy to make it weaker on large scales. That's basically what we're doing in our vanilla lambda CDM model. Um, so anything which else is going to be close to that in terms of the distances, so you, you really are at the level of what people call precision tests. Thank you. Hi. Um, so if you're correct, you've explained some things we couldn't explain before. Yes. Uh, does, it, does your scenario easier to work with than the standard model, or is it more complex? Um, the problem is that there are a lot of things that have to be redone. So what I have at the moment is a phenomenological model. I can make some predictions, but I can't make other predictions. In particular, I have to re we have to redo the whole of the way in which we do standard perturbation theory in the early universe. So the thing is that there's just a lot of things that are work in progress and uh, one can never get that, that requires a lot of people to work on it. So <laughs> my hope is that, um, well, if I, of course if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but if I'm right, then a lot of people will, see the, the, the brain power of thousands of people is directed in a particular direction because that's the way that, that's good for your career. You can only do what, I, what I'm doing once you've got um, tenure. You know, it hasn't hurt my career. I've got, it's got me onto editorial boards and a lot of things. <laughs> but, but it's, uh, you know, um, yeah. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, I think it's fascinating. I'm not quite sure, though. Um, <laughs> my question is, um, do all universes behave the same, or is there some easier ones that I could look at? <laughs> um, <laughs> I had a PhD student who just, I mean, she's just submitted her thesis and, and is a postdoc now, just a month ago, um, and she said, uh, homogeneous universes are all alike, but each inhomogeneous universe is inhomogeneous in its own way. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, hi. I've, I've heard it said that um, if uh, life evolved at a different time, uh, then we would not be able to observe the cosmic microwave background radiation because it's, it will only be present for a relatively small window uh, in the universe's uh, life. Is, could you expand on that and clarify? So, I think yeah? you, so I, I'm not sure if you're alluding to the anthropic principle. I don't want to make anthropic arguments. But well, there, there is, well, a lot of people do resort to the anthropic principle. Uh, so in particular, as soon as you have a, a cosmological constant in there, then there are only particular, because in, if there's a cosmological constant, then the, uh, it, it will dominate over everything else, and the universe will, its expansion will accelerate and keep on going so that uh, it won't be possible to do astronomy anymore because they'll just be, we'll just be here in our bound local group and everything else will have disappeared out of sight. So, um, given a particular scenario, then uh, we could only be at this point in time in that particular universe. Of course, the universe doesn't, that's a model inference. So there are many model, the, the, the complicated thing is that everything we do in this field, you need a model. 
And so as long as you are recognizing where you're doing things because of the limitation of your model that you've put in, then it's okay. <laughs> but, uh, and all of these uh, things that you're discussing about the anthropic principle, many of them are relating to things like having a cosmological constant or not. Any other questions? Was there? Yep. Okay. Last question. Oh, thanks. Um, let's make sure I'm actually on here. Good, yes. Um, hmm. Let's get really speculative now. I, I think you were alluding to it just, just then, actually. So uh, if your model's correct, does that actually change um, the final outcome for the universe? Yes. In terms of, you know, there's, there's expansion, contraction models, runaway expansion, that sort of stuff? Yes. I mean, does this mean that the universe is flatter, or even if it might be sort of lumpy, or, or does it... Uh, I'll, I'll, carry on. <laughs> well, it will get lumpier, but the, the ultimate fate, as far as I'm concerned, the ultimate fate of the universe is actually unknowable as a matter of principle. <laughs> so, um, I'm not sure who said this, but there's a saying, or there's, there's a, a quote I have in my head, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, <laughs> And I think we yeah. might leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> please thank David for me. Thank you. Thank you.